you very much for joining us. Claire Samuel is a visual artist and writer originally from Northern Ireland, and she's now living, living as a settler in Toronto. She holds a BFA from Toronto Met Metropolitan University and an MFA from Concordia University. Her work has been supported by Toronto Arts Council, Ontario Arts, Arts Council and Canada Council for the Arts. Claire has exhibited and screened internationally, most recently at Oboro in Montreal, the Varley Art Gallery, Toronto and Belfast Exposed. She teaches at Ocado, Toronto Metropolitan University and University of Toronto. And she runs an organisation called Feminist Photography Network, which is a collective led by Claire and her collaborator Jennifer Long, based in Toronto. And it's uh, um, the projects emphasise the support and the connection between artists rather than the competition, which is something that's quite important when to leave this place. Um, we aim to promote the careers of women and non-binary photographers, as well as research and reflection on the relationship between gender and lens-based media. So, funded by Canada Council for the Arts, the web exhibition, which is fpnexhibit.com, online exhibition, which has been supported by Street Level, being shown, um, work being shown at Street Level as well, is showcasing the work of 16 artists from Canada and the UK who participated in an online peer-to-peer -peer residency that was run in 2017, 2020 and 2021. Uh, Identity Connection in Place is the name of that online exhibition. And it's there for you to check out at fpnexhibit.com. So collaboration is the theme, I think, and support, which is quite apt for all you guys. I'm going to hand over to Claire and she's going to introduce us to Stacey and tell us a little bit more about FPN. Thanks, Claire. Thanks so much, Sophie. And thank you to Napier for hosting this for us. We really appreciate it. Um, so I'm speaking to you today from a place currently called Toronto, which is the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat peoples, many of whom still live here today. Um, as Sophie said, <clears throat> fpnexhibit.com uh, is work from the three peer-to-peer -peer residencies that we've run. And Stacey Tyrell participated in our 2017 and our 2020 residencies. <clears throat> Stacey Tyrell was born and raised in Toronto to parents of Navisian heritage. She graduated from OCAD, U OCAD University, where she majored in photography. Her images have appeared in shows at the Scottish National Gallery of Modern Art, the Royal Ontario Museum, the Power Plant Contemporary Art Gallery, and Canadian Museum for Immigration, and are currently on show at the Art Museum at University of Toronto. Her work is part of the Royal Bank of Canada Fine Art Collection, the Centre for Photography at Woodstock, and the Wedge Permanent Collection. Her images have also been featured in such publications as the Focal Press, Companion to the Constructed Image, Lens, Cult Lens Culture, Wasafiri Literary Journal, Mufon, Woman of the Diaspora, Canadian Art, Prefix Photo, Feature Shoot, Pictures from Paradise, A Survey of Caribbean Photographers, Renewing Feminisms, and See Me Here, a survey of contemporary self-portraits from the Caribbean. Meticulously researched, Tyrell's images work to visualize the complex and violent histories of race as a social construct. Her projects explore the interplay of race, heritage, immigration, and identity as it pertains to post-colonial societies and the Caribbean diaspora. So I'll hand you over to Stacey now. Hey everyone, uh, let me just get my presentation up. Okay, so um, as I get started, I just want to give you a little bit about myself. So as uh, Claire had mentioned, um, I was born and raised in Toronto, Canada, um, and I consider myself a first generation Canadian, which in my mind, that means that I'm the first generation of my family to be born in Canada. Um, both my parents were immigrants from the island of Nevis in the Caribbean. And just for a little bit of context, um, Nevis is a very tiny island. It's only about 38 miles square and has a population of about 11,000 people. 
but um, historically it was a really important hub for the slave cotton sugar trades um, that took place in the 16th, 17th and 18th century. And it was one of the many islands in the Caribbean that was at one point either held by the Spanish, the French or the English respectively, where the black slaves outnumbered um, their white masters due to the size of the plantations and the manufacturing operations that happened there. Um, and at one point, uh, it was the headquarters for the Royal African Company, whose logo you can see here on the screen. And basically that meant that um, at one point, all of the other islands had to come there to its slave markets in order to purchase slaves to then bring over to the other um, islands. It was also the birthplace of Alexander Hamilton and also where Fanny Nisbet um, here on the left uh, met and married Horatio Nelson, who you might recognize as being on top of the pillar at Trafalgar Square. So um, just for that historical context, like it really does uh, play a part in not only the story of colonization, but also that of uh, really the story of North America. And that's something that often gets forgotten um, when we think about America and Canada and, you know, quote unquote, the new world. Um, so to get started, uh, basically, I see every body of work uh, that I've made sort of as a step in a journey in terms of like my own uh, self-discovery and also that of uh, identity. And um, so the first one that I'm going to show you here is a body of work I had created as my thesis project uh, that sort of bled into the first years of my art practice that I had called Position as Desired. Um, so originally, uh, the name of the series sprung from a wish uh, that I had to sort of dive into my mother's identity uh, before she had um, immigrated to Canada and from a time from before I was born. Um, my mother had originally come from Nevis to uh, England, and she lived in London, and then eventually came to Canada, where she was an au pair. Um, so she didn't really bring much with her from her life in England. And among the few, uh, let's say, like items that she brought with her uh, were two photo albums that I felt like represented her life before, you know, like I knew her. And I felt that maybe by delving into these details of her life that I'd be able to sort of form my own narratives um, from the spaces that I saw and um, somehow also gain access into her experiences through these albums. Um, so just a couple things about the family album itself before I uh, get into the images here. Um, a lot of the time we sort of see them as record and I know that now in this day and age, like the album itself probably seems like a really archaic sort of means of, um, you know, like representing like family history. But, um, you know, the same could be said for the images that we see on our phones that we take of our daily lives, where we're sort of assuming that these are accurate portrayals of um, a particular place in time. And that, you know, the, the album and these images themselves, they sort of act as a catalyst for long laid dormant memories. And, um, you know, uh, I sort of created this series at a time when, um, you know, like photographic process was very much sort of half rooted in the analog. And then we were just transitioning into digital. And so I've had over the years, people um, ask, you know, like, would this project have been any different? But to be honest, I, even though it's sort of, um, a more analog means of actually physically photographing an album and sort of forming um, visual narratives. Um, I think that the same uh, the the same meaning is still sort of behind it in terms of reframing these narratives and then also exploring like physical uh, keepsakes and psychic space, um, as well as just trying to depict. Uh, you know, black life in a really everyday sort of manner. Um, you know, unfortunately I've had the experience where, uh, you know, um, some people are under the impression that, um, you know, immigrant and um, like non-white experiences are very different um, from their own in terms of the familial, when really uh, they're not, it just happens to maybe look slightly different than what um, some viewers might be seeing. So um, as you can see here, um, just photographing the pages. 
and really trying to sort of convey this uh, story of um, not only like immigration and memory, but also how, um, you know, like these um, can get sort of jumbled up. And even like the treatment of the photographs themselves at the time, I found really interesting because um, photographs used to be really physical. You know, sometimes you would find like they'd be ripped out several times and rearranged in albums or even, um, you know, like written upon or somebody had ripped off a corner in order to use it for a scrap piece of paper. So they're, they were treated like very different than how we treat them right now. Um, so before I go on, I just want to sort of for a little bit, um, really briefly just talk about representation in general. So a lot of, uh, the source material that I use, uh, for my imagery and my art practice tends to come from like historical painting and etchings as well as, um, photographs. But, um, part of what is a little problematic, but then allows me the leeway to sort of, you know, delve further is that generally these depictions tend to kind of come in two forms. So you can see here on the left where you sort of have this almost like benign image of um, the African slave. These ones are well-dressed. Uh, obviously they're sort of higher up um, servants in a household and they seem rather docile and to be like at peace with what it is, I guess, like the life that they're living. Or you have these depictions that, um, very much depicting like what was happening at the time, but extremely violent, um, where again, you know, like the black body is just sort of treated as objects, whether it's like the object of like um, sadism and torture or um, of forced domestication and uh, servitude. And then you even sort of see uh, a little bit of this translates then into the Victorian and the um, Edwardian era where um, these are sort of old postcards that I collect um, where um, they were shot maybe about like 120 years ago. And a lot of them actually end up in Europe because obviously postcards are used to, um, you know, like as souvenirs and to send like short messages to people. But you can see here where, you know, like you're sort of getting these depictions of everyday life, but at the same time, the identity of the subjects are very much um, stripped away from them. So on the left here, you can see where it just states like laborers in a country district. And then um, on the right, where it's almost given sort of like a national, an old school National Geographic uh, treatment where um, it says here like a group of natives and their hut when really, uh, you know, like these are um, just local farm people that are probably just living in, you know, obviously their house, which just tends to have palm fronds and things like that as the thatching for the roof. And then the other thing is that you also see um, black bodies sort of depicted as uh, either curiosity or stereotype. So here, um, this was one of the least offensive ones, believe it or not, that I could find where you um, see it titled uh, Two Little Moonshiners Away From Their Watchful Eye, sort of depicting, um, you know, Black children as, uh, well, in this instance, I guess, drunks and a little, uh, not even a little, but sort of um, almost savage, um, incapable of, you know, um, staying clean and also uh, wearing proper clothes. Um, which I find really contrasts, um, say, this photo, which is of my grandparents and um, two of my uncles who have now passed away, um, just as a regular uh, domestic family where they are dressed in the garb of the era and look like normal people. Um, so on the back of that, uh, I created uh, a series that... Um, I'd been working on uh, for a while uh, called um, chattel, where um, first of all, the term basically refers to a movable piece or immovable piece of property. And then it also refers to slaves since slaves were seen as property. And um, it also refers to a style of house that you find in the Caribbean. So um, you can see here on the left is my mother standing in front of what's referred to as a chattel house where they're placed on top of rocks and they were developed um, after slavery 
as a means of not only creating shelter, but then also um, making the houses movable. So wherever somebody happened to be farming someone's land, the house could easily be picked up and then moved over. Um, and then you can see myself and my sister here with my great grandfather on the right um, in front of the same house. And you can still see the sort of temporary nature of it, even though um, permanent uh, type fixtures were made in front of it. So with the series, um, I really wanted to reflect the transient nature of the story of the West Indies and the island of Nevis where my family is from. Um, nearly every aspect of the island from its structures, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and people at some point in history have been chattel. And my parents grew up with what was known as chattel houses, which I just explained to you. Um, in the post-slavery economies, these houses were meant for tenant farmers and um, also in the event of like a dispute with uh, the particular landowner um, you might have been having, you could just pick up your house and then move somewhere else. And in a lot of cases, these houses are still standing and they're a reminder of a post-plantation life when at any moment one's possessions and homes could be packed up and taken elsewhere. And this idea of home that you could take with you is very reminiscent of the migration experience uh, of establishing a life in a new country. Okay. And so um, in the 50s and the 60s, there were waves of people that left the Caribbean for England, Canada, and the United States. And they were going in search of a new life and also to escape grinding poverty. Um, these people were able to create new lives, but um, that soon replaced their own. But um, just like myself, uh, you know, returning back to the Caribbean at some point, like it becomes a ritual. And with each visit, you sort of get this sense of displacement. And it's like, I've seen this with my own family. And I've also seen it with my own experience where like a lot of countries, it's constantly in the midst of a transition. Um, everywhere you see examples of contemporary life that are existing with an old and rapidly dying way of life. And so in my case, I find that I tend to really romanticize the images that I have of these family trips of my youth and in stark contrast to what is like now taking place. And so all of these sort of dirt roads and donkeys that I remember are being replaced with um, pavement and even like farm animals are feral. Um, there now for the most part. And um, in these images, it's like I'm trying to um, create a sort of connection um, to what I'm experiencing every time that I return there where, um, you know, I really feel like an outsider looking in. And a lot of the people that I have known have just sort of moved away and died. And then also just, uh, you know, you can see these sort of slight references to also um, what took place before. So um, before I show you the images, I just wanted to show you here, this is like a slave registry. Um, that was, usually these were created not because people actually wanted to keep track of um, who they owned or what they had. It more had to do with compensation and a census that was um, created by the uh, English government in order that once slavery ended, they could be properly um, compensated for uh, the loss of their property. Um, and then that same house that uh, I just showed you, this is what it looks like today, where you know nature has sort of taken over and overgrown itself. Um, at one point there were animals living in the house and then the um, city government had just come along and paved over the road and then dumped a bunch of dirt over it. Um, but with these images, you know, I really wanted to sort of create this sense of loss, but then also how you have this sense of the old still there while the new is taking place. And this island is just full of these types of spaces where places that like I just remember being occupied, um, they'll stay there for decades now unoccupied, and they just sort of revert back to the landscape. Um, here, this is a baobab tree that the French had brought over from Africa, I think in the 1700s. Um, you know, they brought over that and as well as um, different animal species that were not native that now um, run rampant over there, including the vervet monkey. This is my grandmother's house before it was torn down. And then even these old plantations that then became resorts that then a hurricane came along and then absolutely destroyed them. And then you can see here now where it's been taken over by wild horses and goats.
And then everywhere in the landscape, you see these remnants of the sugar industry, um, just but the the late phases of it. So a lot of this machinery is actually brought over from Scotland and in particular in Glasgow. And you can see um, the markings on them um, when you just walk up close to them. A lot of these things, because they were too heavy to um, transport, they were sort of left in place. Or as you can see here, um, what they call like a copper, which used to be used for boiling sugar. Um, now, well, when my grandparents, uh, they didn't have indoor plumbing, they would use that um, to collect water to wash dishes in the floors and things like that. And again, you just see where nature has sort of overgrown everything. And then this is on the grounds of uh, a plantation that then became a resort that then was destroyed in a hurricane and never rebuilt. And um, the local lore sort of has it that this was a structure that was used for punishment of slaves. So um, they were often like locked up in there. And so I sort of hit a point um, where like, like a lot of artists, like I wanted to continue to sort of dig deeper into my practice and maybe even myself and sort of find out where um, I fit in the world. And so uh, before I got to the work that I currently make, um, I started just um, getting interested in sort of even like the basic aesthetics of whiteness and why um, it's sort of held up on a pedestal. So um, eventually I decided to create like a still life series, um, which I titled The Great White Hope, where I collected a bunch of whitening products uh, just because I was just fascinated by um, their worldwide use because you can find these for sale everywhere from the Caribbean to Asia. In a lot of countries, they outsell Coca-Cola in terms of their popularity. And then what's also fascinating about using these types of products is that a lot of the time with overuse, they can have the opposite effect. So instead of whitening your skin, it can become hyperpigmentization and so then you end up becoming darker as a result. And it's interesting how, um, you know, uh, the sort of problem, let's say, of having darker skin gets reduced to a topical uh, treatment and also like a problem that can easily be erased by using products. So what I did uh, with this series also is I used a technique called silhouing, which you see a lot in magazines where um you know it's like they photograph the different beauty products and where you see like oh you want to try this um these are 10 lipsticks to try or something like that and um by sort of um isolating them on these backgrounds you can really um see just the, how stark these names are like extract and then a lot of these uh products have names like white perfect um, they're made by brands that you're very familiar with in Western markets, but then you don't realize in foreign markets, uh, they make these things like you'd see Pons and Nivea, and uh, even there's pills that you can ingest to try to whiten your skin, which um, I just found really insane. Uh, and they also have names like Skin Success and Skin White. Um, so by creating these uh, still lives like i found that that really wasn't it really wasn't um it was it was part of exploring things but at the same time it's like i wanted to delve further and eventually that led me into the self-portrait work um that i do now so one of the first iterations of that was a series i created called backward blood and uh, just to sort of break down the title, um, the term bakra is, or bakra is a really old fashioned slang um, that is derived from African languages that either refers to a white person or uh, like a white master or an oppressor and also things associated with whiteness, whether that was vegetables or quality of cloth or any of these things that then um, slaves were not allowed to have. And then blood is a reference to um, my Scottish heritage. And um, as far as I know, it's a word of Scots origin, meaning blood of men, animals, or kin. So um, 
as I said before, you know, in my family, I very much know that there are people there from um, Scotland, Ireland, all over like the United Kingdom and parts of Western Europe. And um, I really wanted to sort of see where exactly in terms of my identity by exploring these uh, notions and using it to sort of contrast my own physical identity, exactly where that would take me visually. So here on the left, I believe this is one of my great, great grandfathers. And then this is my grandfather here who his father was a man from Scotland. And so as I've gone on this, uh, it's, it's really sort of just like a, I don't want to call it like a quest, but just this, um, path that I continue to go down and I sort of dig up these pictures of people that I believe that I'm related to through using sites like ancestry.com. Um, you know, I just become more and more, uh, fascinated with, um, who or what might be out there. And so where this project also really started, the origins, I would say, were from my youth, where I attended a predominantly white school, where, you know, on occasion, I'd listen to classmates proudly state, and this is a thing in North America, I don't know about in the UK, but very much people are like, oh, my family's from Scotland, or we're from Ireland, or we're from Wales. And, you know, like I would silently acknowledge the fact that um, I also had that heritage. And I remember these exercises in class where, you know, they would have us, um, you know, it's like make the um, flag for whatever country your family came from. And, uh, you know, there was one time where I was talking to a young girl who uh, had said that her family is from Scotland. And I said, oh, part of my family is from Scotland. And she actually called me a liar and said that that was impossible. And I guess even at the time, um, you know, um, children like not understanding that it is possible that people that don't look like them can have roots in these same countries. So where I sort of began was, uh, this was a while ago, um, was taking these uh, DNA tests. And at first there was a kit from the National Geographic Company where I had taken it and at the time due to the technology, um, I got back a result that then just said that I have an ancestor that was black and female from Africa. And knowing that there was more to the story, I wrote them and I asked, and they said that because of the time they were only, I think uh, using mitochondrial DNA and that they could only tell from like from male to male to male. That's why I got the result that I did. And as time sort of progressed and these tests have gotten more sophisticated with the data sets that they're able to collect, um, you can see here uh, the different um, results uh, that I've gotten. And some of them have actually been quite surprising for me. So like you can see here where um, not only does, uh, you know, like Scottish, uh, ancestry show up, but you also see Norway, Wales, um, Spain and Portugal, which I'm not surprised at, and also France and Germany. Um, so with this series of creating these characters, um, I really wanted to sort of get at the fact that the reason that I have this DNA in my family is, or just in my genetic makeup is due to a very disturbing history of um, you know, like the transatlantic slave trade and immigration and all of these things that happened and that most of the people that you find in the, um, in North America and the Caribbean and South and Central America, um, were sort of these hybrids of all of the different populations that had come there in whatever capacity. Um, and just, uh, how in general, whenever you know that conversation might come up how it can be a little disturbing um for uh people to sort of you know really have to look at and realize this ugly chapter in human history um so these characters are sort of like an attempt for me to explore the relatives that i feel are out there like past or present and um another thing just uh because i know that you guys are studying um photography or fine art in general is, you know, like my practice is very research based. So um, one of the things uh, that I find completely fascinating and that I refer to um, on top of uh, just historic painting and photographs and archives and all of these things are some of the systems that were put in place uh, that then 
helped uh, create the laws and the structures that we know for colonialism, especially in the quote unquote new world. So one of those in particular was um, in the Spanish colonies, they had a caste system that they called the encomiendas that um, was developed by the Spanish crown in order to maintain order in the colonies and also as like a tribute system in terms of who paid taxes and who did not and then who were allowed certain privileges. So you can see here, there's a lot of historic painting from that part of the world where the different racial um, combinations are sort of created in these charts and then each one is given a name and then that sort of allows under the law what that particular person is allowed to do. Um, you can see here on the bottom left uh, that it's a very rigid uh, social structure and this is a basic triangle of it. And you can see that there was no movement between the classes because it was strictly dictated by race. And um, it's interesting that, um, you know, it's like even the construct of race is really um, like a modern, a fairly modern um, concept that's been around for like less than a thousand years. And then another, um, this sort of, I just really wanted to point this painting out here and um, it's called Ham's Redemption and it was made by a Portuguese artist. And here you can see at work, um, it depicts a really controversial racial theory that was particular to Brazil um, that they referred to as blanqueamento, blanqueamento um, of the different generations, which basically they were one of the few colonies that decided that in order to eradicate the black population or to reduce it, um, they were going to, for want of a better word, breed it out. So here you can see the grandmother, I guess, is thanking God that her biracial daughter now has a child with a white man. And so then now has a white grandchild and thus supposedly erasing the curse of her race. So um, just to get back to the series of self-portraits that I created, um, you know, like it really is a process of, um, you know, like putting on and sort of um, donning this makeup. And by the reason that I chose this method is that I wanted to, by erasing like the major um, indicator of my race and thus a lot of people, they sort of start and stop with my identity there. Uh, where, um, so just by sort of taking that away and then seeing what sort of comes to the forefront in terms of the markers of other uh, races um, by uh, just um, donning white makeup and also um, straight hair. So there's always like this moment where um, when going through this process where I'm getting towards the end of it and it's really, uh, it's really strange because even though I know it's myself, it's it, it's a complete stranger looking back at me. And just even the fact that like when I put on the wig and it's like, I'm usually sourcing these things from places where, you know, mainly black women go to purchase hair that really is European style hair, or it comes from India or South America. And then in order to sort of fix this, to, to sort of fit into this, um, aesthetic of like a Eurocentric sense of beauty is it's really a fascinating exercise. So um, with these images, I do all the makeup myself. I do all the propping. I use an assistant um, that helps me just get to the spaces that like I can't get, but um, I light it, I set up the shots. And um, again, you know, it's like, just to mention that there's a real dualism in um, the constructs of whiteness and blackness in uh, Western society. Like you sort of need one to uh, play off of the other, but it also leaves very little room for any sort of nuance. And it reduces each group to basically a monolith. And it sort of does away with uh, the fact that there is a lot of history and um, nuance that actually is involved in personal identity as well as racial identity. Um, and that by, you know, removing something like my skin color, it sort of forces people to sort of look, actually look at me and see that there could be a lot of similarities um, to themselves even in, in my face.
so with all of these images, I'm actually really not doing very much to alter my appearance aside from the makeup and the hair. Um, I'm slightly thinning my nose and then tweaking my eye color and that's about it. Um, and, you know, I found like a lot of uh, the results to be actually really startling. Um, there's also part of it that with the gaze of the um, subject themselves, just really trying to mimic like old portraiture where um, the eyes kind of follow you. And that um, there is something about these characters that definitely um, enters the uncanny valley, let's say, um, where, you know, it's like they, they are, they look like people, but there's also something very um, off and, you know, whether it's the opacity of the skin or just even the posturing. Um, and even, uh, you know, like I find, in general, it's a fascinating exercise just because it also um, has to do with my own perceptions of whiteness and sort of what comes to the surface because I'm making the assumption that a lot of these people that I I know are out there are sort of middle class or upper middle class when really, um, you know, just like the family I grew up in, it's like they're just uh, regular working class people more than likely. But um, I guess this is also part of the, um, you know, for want of a better term, drag of, um, you know, portraying these characters and sort of exploring this part of my heritage. And so the next series that I'm going to share with you, which is uh, what is currently on display at the University of Toronto um, Art Gallery, is called Pour la Victoire. Now, um, a part of my family, or my family, how they came to England, they were part of the Windrush generation. And um, for those of you that aren't familiar with that term, basically that means that like after World War II, England needed to be rebuilt and it advertised to its citizens in the colonies, um, many of whom had actually fought in the war, to come and help rebuild England and be part of the post-war boom um, since it had been destroyed physically in World War II. And so my grandparents, um, as teenagers and young adults, uh, they decided to go and make a life for themselves in a foreign land um, you know, like they were educated in the British school system and taught um, that they were British and they'd been taught their entire lives um, that they were proud citizens of the empire and that it was one in which the sun never set because its domain and its reach were so large and they would recite rule Britannia and proclaim that Britons would never be slaves, not realizing the irony in these lyrics um, where, you know, the very, the very descendants of the slaves themselves are actually coming over to England to sort of seek their fortunes. And um, what actually greeted them um, when they arrived was blatant and widespread racism, uh, where people were constantly being turned away by landlords and pubs refused to serve them drinks. Uh, my grandparents and a lot of my older relatives have a lot of stories about this. They also had to survive things like the Teddy Boy riots in London that were set off by trivial things like a married couple where the husband was black and the wife was white, having an argument in the street and then white men coming to this woman's supposed rescue, um, thus setting off a riot or race riots in Nottingham, um, where you had like a powder keg being created by the newer immigrants coming in, seeking their fortunes. Um, and that the local population not liking that. Um, and, you know, I always, uh, you know, when I talk to students, I sort of mention like that Mark Twain quote, um, which I think is very apt, because even when you see um, in the past 10 years, um, things like Brexit, which have happened, um, that history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. So um, unfortunately, you know, like this is not um, new behavior. Um, so with this series, I really wanted to explore this idea of the female allegories for nationhood, uh, specifically with North America and Europe, and how it um, shows this ideal representation of like white womanhood in particular, and that, um, you know, like these figures are very common in the Victorian and the Edwardian era, and they often depict like virginal, demure, nobly um, looking off up into the future, um, these sort of figures that were used as a rallying point for troops and patriots to fight on her behalf, 
Her gaze is neutral and she's often looking upwards and towards a glorious manifest destiny. Um, she's magnanimous in her demeanor and it's permeated with her assumed cultural superiority as well as these notions of progress and civilization. And really there's like a paradox that's embedded in that relationship of any colonial power and its former subjects and its current subjects. Um, because they're taught at an early age to love and protect her in order to find themselves. But then, um, you know, however naive it is, that expectation is that that love would be returned. But often when um, these citizens go to sort of seek their fortunes on her uh, soil, let's say, um, you know, they become the very embodiment of other and um, are sort of treated as objects in disdain and therefore not accepted into the warmth of her love despite serving her. Um, you know, you can see this here, like some of these are very heavy handed. You can see here from World War One, and then Columbia, which is the allegory for um, America here reaching her arms out longingly. Um, and then paintings like this, like Manifest Destiny or American Progress, where it is the allegory for Manifest Destiny. And you can see here, there's a woman in the center. Uh, she's Columbia and she has the star of the empire on her forehead. Um, she's moving from light skies and these developed ports and bridges and cities of the east. And you can see the sun rising here, like the dawning of a new day and that she's leading the settlers by holding um these telecommunication i'm sorry telegraph telegraph cables she's bringing the railroad she's bringing um the mail system and she is chasing out the native population and this sort of wild landscape um and really you know supposedly bringing civility to an untamed land and i, I use that very very loosely and sarcastically um, so with this series, uh, again, just sort of taking on um, and embod trying to embody these allegories for country. So see here you have um, Boudicca or Britannia, and a lot of these uh, allegories are derived from uh, the goddess Athena and sort of play into this uh, notion of Greek and Roman um, statuary also equating itself with like white superiority. You have Dame Wales in Caledonia, in Hispania. Oh, running out of time. I'm almost done, I promise. Uh, the allegory for Portugal, Marianne in France, and the Dutch maiden, in Colombia in the United States, Svea. Ireland, Star of Italy, I think Denmark, Norway, and Canadiana for Canada. And um, the reason that I chose these countries are the ones that um, they predominantly had roles in the slave trade and um, colonization, uh, specifically in the Caribbean. And so that's why I chose to um, depict those ones, though I know that there are many other countries that also played their role. Um, so just to sort of wrap up here, I just want to talk about like where I'm at in terms of my or pra practice and talk about like works in progress. So again, I'm digging into the archive, looking at painting specifically with how like white femininity um, sort of plays into this, uh, where it finds itself within um, whiteness. And then also looking at paintings like this one, which is one of my favorites of Elizabeth Dido Bell and her cousin, um, Lady Elizabeth Bell, both of these women lived in Kenwood House on Hampstead Heath in London. And, uh, you know, like just even in this interaction, you can tell that um, Dido, who's here on the left, sort of goes beyond just being a decorative piece for a white figure <clears throat> that she's actually depicted um, in a more, um, say, like human aspect and actually given a personality. And then also by how she's dressed, it seems like she occupies some sort of status in the household. And um, that's sort of the jumping off point for me beginning to create images like this one here, um, where I sort of have like a mistress and slave character um, sort of juxtaposed together. And I believe that's that's it, and I've used my time. 
I just want to thank you guys for um, just being here and allowing me to talk about my work. Thank you, Stacey. That was amazing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That was fantastic, Stacey. Um, uh, Stacey, I wonder if we could keep you in the room and I'm just trying to juggle five different things at the same time. Um, I'm just going to show you our students who are all here. Hi. There we are. It's kind to see them. Maybe if I hold my screen like this. Yeah, I can see them. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, does anyone in the room here have any questions for Stacey before I check the chat to see um, what we've got down here? And and it could be anything. Just even like if it's just like I'm out of school now, and how do I go on this road of creating my art practice or any of that kind of stuff? Um, please feel free. Well, I've got a question. Yeah. Uh, I really like your work. I just want to say thank you for uh, I'm curious, like, how does you show this brings into and you make a living out of this? Sorry, that was that was really quiet. Oh, so, so what was the, the last part? I heard, I heard. Thank you very much for. <laughs> um, but could you repeat the question? Yeah, Diego is asking how how do you make this personal work and this exhibition work something which uh, finances your career, or is this your main line of work? We're talking a lot about final year and making that transition from the yeah, college absolutely. situation to real life. Absolutely. Um, first, I, I wish it was the way that I make uh, money, but alas, it is not. Um, so really, you have to start from a place of, uh, you know, being like, this is sort of what I'm passionate about and that no matter what, I'm going to make this work. So like, that's, that's where um, I'm, I still create stuff. But at the same time, I'm lucky enough that I have found employment sort of in the same realm that I studied. So I do work in the commercial photo industry. And then I have applied for um, grants and other artistic things like that, that then allow me, um, whether that's like through different government bodies or um, even I personally finance myself sometimes. So then that's why it takes longer to create work. But um, I, I'm not sure about how it works in uh, Scotland specifically, but I know that, um, you know, by still working in the photo industry, I have access to certain supplies and things like that um that then allow me uh to be able to work on stuff so really you know it's like it's going to be very rare that you find an artist that doesn't have a day job um and that it's very important that um i always tell students if don't necessarily make your uh art practice contingent on you making money because that's a very quick way of um I don't want to say making you hate it, but it's just sort of like you're almost like sacrificing it on the altar of like either to be a real artist, I have to make 100% of my living that way. And really, um, it doesn't like I've, I've met fantastic artists that, you know, their day job is that they work as an engineer or something like that. And like, you just never know. <laughs> I think that's going with engineering. I'm just saying yeah. like, you, it, and it doesn't matter. Like, I, I know I have friends that like work, um, they, they worked at supermarkets forever and they, they were showing in museums and mm. you, you know it's like just as long as you have something that is covering your bases and that kind of gives you time in order to sort of allow yourself to do what it is that you love like that's really all that matters i think we've all got to have more than one string, string to our bow somehow yeah, yeah. exactly <laughs> that's good to know um my question was related to your research and it's wonderful to see work that's so um, intertwined with your own personal archive um, the colonial history that you explore through personal viewpoint which is fascinating and emotional and we've got some students here who are working with archive and trying to work out how to incorporate their own family stories into you know broader issues to kind of bring that personal link and i just wondered if you had any pointers for where they might start, you know, do you browse the albums? How do you think about presentation, et cetera? Um, <clears throat> what the, a couple things to say on that. Um, I think that uh, 
first, first of all, it's like exploring themes to do with family and things like that can be very tough, not just because of what it might bring up as the individual, but also, um, I'm not sure how many of you guys have actually tried to take portraits of your family, but sometimes it's like those can be the hardest ones to do because um, you know, like we all bring things with us, uh, you know, like when we get behind a camera and then also there might be walls that go up. So even like with that first project that I did, part of the reason that I sort of reverted to using a family album is because I would try to talk to my mother or photograph my mother and she would just get very stiff and want to avoid the whole thing and really shut it down. And um, I, it forced me in a good way to sort of explore non-traditional ways of sort of getting at maybe what it is I'm trying to convey. So like that's also where um, like the archive itself or even by using like still life as a language. Um, I've had friends that have done beautiful things that sort of reference um, memori mento and those types of things. But then they're also referencing like archive and family and experience. And there's a lot of things that you can evoke by um, with, without even necessarily having to use the actual subject. So um, there, there's more than one way to sort of attack um, that visually and just to be open a bit to that if you find that you're not really necessarily getting what, what it is. Mm. Yeah, I think that's good. Um, a good point that there's more than one way to make a portrait, for example. And then yeah. in terms of accessing albums and historical archive material and things, how, do you have any advice for them on that? That can be, feel like a needle in a haystack or they don't know where to start? Oh, well, um, I, th I think what's great now is that so many collections and things like that are digitized. So, you know, it's like, when I was making that album project, it was like the very, it was the early days of the internet. So, you know, it's like none of, you couldn't just go to the British library and like look up stuff, but there's so much, there's so many archives um, that you can access online. So depending on um, the subject matter, like say in my particular case, like I, I, any, anywhere that I can, I just kind of search their database. So like, you know, like the British library, um, there's uh, a lot of like city archives or museum archives where you'd be astounded like what they have in their collections or what um, private people have donated or just even like locally if you know like you're actually from <clears throat> the area where the um, where your college is located uh, but um, you know it's like cast a wide net and um, and then just sort of like zero in from there uh, and as well, like if it involves like another country, just even trying to see like what um, digitized things they might have. Or in my case, um, you know, like I found some stuff on like Ancestry.com that um, that was before they put up that massive paywall. But, um, you know, it's like there's 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 ways of just sort of getting the little pieces of your puzzle to then sort of and, and just even um, that second last image uh, that I showed of. Um, the, the photo of like the the um, the the black woman with the two white children like that was from the um, Rijks Museum collection in Amsterdam like I just happen to you know like you you you'd just be amazed what you can find if you just start searching on all these different sites for at these institutions. Great, I think that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, any more questions from the room? Will I open this chat box and see what's in there? Any questions from those of us who are joining us online? You're welcome to speak out. Can I just ask you, Stacey? Um, yeah. You touched on it um, in Port of Victoire, um, but wondering if you could speak a bit more about the connection between whiteness and femininity and why it was female figures that were chosen to be those kind of figureheads. Um, yeah, so in like my particular case, or well, not in my particular case, but just in general, and especially like in North America, um, a lot of, even if you go in the history of like certain laws and things like that here, um, a lot of policy and societal impressions and things like that are created in a response to um, 
it's almost like this like hysteria that can get created by say an attack on a particular vulnerable group and then in this case i'm talking about like um you know like white women let's say that um for white male masculinity i mean this like historically is that that's something that's always seen or just even you see it in other cultures where for some reason it's like the chastity and the purity of women um really play into their national identity and even their masculine identity and so um these sort of symbols as an extension of um something to be protected sort of lend itself to even the whole uh you know it's like whether that's like um like the motherhood and nation and nurturing but also like wisdom if we go back to um you know like greek mythology and like these figures and that you know like as a black woman that constantly has to live within this sort of frame of a particular standard of beauty that's only changed say really in the past 10 years um it's it's something that like i also don't necessarily get to participate in because it's like it's not my femininity that needs to be defended really you know um so so that's a part of like where that was coming from in that choice mm -hmm. thanks Well, uh, Claire and Stacey, please stay online, but it just remains for me to say a huge thank you from all of us here at Main Care, and uh, thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for, um, thanks everyone that joined us online as well. It's been a really interesting talk to hear from you. Thank you very much.